Stock markets remain under pressure as Sensex and Nifty fail to hold opening gains. Banks and metal stocks lead the decline. Rupee weakens by nearly 30 pesa against the dollar. The World Economic Forum kicks off in Davos with fears of a global recession looming large. IMF says international relationships are worsening after decades, warns that economic fragmentation could cut global economic output by up to 7%. As the world's rich and powerful gather at Davos, Oxfam warns of widening inequality. A new report shows the richest 1% have amassed nearly two-thirds of all global wealth created since the pandemic. The top 1% of India's population owns more than 40% of the country's wealth. Union Law Minister Giran Rijiju writes to the Chief Justice of India, Justice D.Y. Chandrachur, seeks a government representative in the collegium which appoints judges to higher courts. Opposition parties slam the move, calling it a poison pill for an independent judiciary. Law Minister hits back, says his letter is in conformity with the observations and directions of the Supreme Court Constitution bench. Wholesale price inflation in India falls below 5%, the slowest pace of growth in the last 22 years. Fall in food prices was the key driver. India's trade deficit in December remains largely flat at nearly $24 billion in December. Exports and imports rise on a monthly basis but decline on a yearly basis. Layoffs continue across startups. Dunzo fires 3% of its staff. ShareChat cuts 20% of its workforce. Rebel Foods lays off less than 2% of its employees. No interimary relief for Google over penalties imposed by the Competition Commission of India. Supreme Court asks Google if the company is willing to adopt its European practices in India as well. This after CCI argued that Google is discriminating against Indian customers and is compliant with similar orders in Europe. Nepal observes a day of mourning after the worst aviation disaster in three decades killed 68 people. Investigators find the black box and cockpit voice recorder of the Yeti airline plane that crashed yesterday. Russia and Belarus begin joint air force drills, sparking fears of a new offensive in Ukraine. Western intelligence officials say Moscow could use its ally to launch a new ground campaign. This even as Russia continues to pound cities in eastern Ukraine. Viacom 18 backs the rights to broadcast the inaugural edition of the Women's Premier League. Viacom 18 will shell out nearly $117 million, which translates to more than 7 crore rupees for every match. Well, those are the headlines at this hour. Let me hand it over to Shireen Bhan now in Davos for our special coverage. Welcome back. You're watching our continuing coverage here from Davos 2023. I'm Shireen Bhan and joining me now is the global CEO of Bain, Manny Masida. Always a pleasure, Manny. Great to have you back on the program. The world doesn't look very different except for the fact that May was a summer Davos. This is a winter Davos, but essentially the problems and the challenges that we were talking about then continue. Well, it's nice to uh, see you again, Shireen, and, and you're right. It's, it's sort of winter. We're back to... Uh... I guess it's 2020 the last time we were uh, we were together and I'd say what what's different from May is that in the prior three years the world almost navigated COVID together mm. remember Davos Gen 2020 synchronous growth COVID came we reacted um, we responded strong 2021 we were looking at uh, optimism in 22 and then Russia invaded Ukraine yeah. and then we're sort of still, as a world, a little bit in shock last May. What happens now that, that we've had this? Uh, and now we've had eight months to wrestle with the implications of post-globalization, uh, energy, still trying to advance a sustainability agenda. It's just a much more uh, complicated world, but we're now, I think, settling into we have to deal. <laughs> with a more complicated world. We than have no did. choice, right? <laughs> you know, and, and I'd say uh, we've maybe been uh, lucky as a global leadership that prior to uh, 2020, 
there was a long period of stability. Mm -hmm. This meeting itself was about globalization, economic growth was happening. We hadn't had a, a major shock since 2008, 2009. Now we've had a few of them in a row, and suddenly is this, is this the new normal? Yeah. And we're back to dealing with so much uncertainty. The era of poly crises, which is what the <laughs> WEF is warning us about. But, you know, as you talk to clients, as you talk to global CEOs, what are they talking about in their boardroom today? Are they preparing for uh, the baseline situation, which is a mild recession? Are they preparing for a harsher, more protracted recession? Uh, what does that mean in terms of spends? Uh, what are they factoring in at this point, point in time? So I would say the answer to that actually varies quite a bit. And so the difference from three years ago when everybody was optimistic, whether it's by geography, by industry. So if you look what's happening today, um, optimism or pessimism can vary a lot by country, mm -hmm. um, by what's the state of your energy supply and security, how dependent are you on what's called post-globalization mm -hmm. as, uh, as China sort of um, was off the global economy for a while and is re-entering. So the, uh, the answer is everybody is using this time to actually um, look at all of their strategic choices with a world that's been quite different compared to what we were used to. So we have to address, okay, it's now post-globalizing. What does that mean? Mm. Um, we've been in low interest rates globally for a long time. That varies country by country. We're going to be higher. Capital is going to be scarcer. We still have to invest in ESG, but... Yeah. Can we make those investments given the, given the economy? So I'd say everyone is taking a, a planning uh, perspective that's much more scenario-based. You know, nobody can make point estimates about, uh, and it's got to be very specific to the portfolio of my company mm. and companies that are concentrated in one country versus one region versus globally are, are operating uh, with very different very different assumptions. So, I would, there's not a consistent view of optimism or pessimism. I think what we'll find through this week is it's actually much more specific and, and diverse. Uh, you're right in pointing that out. But, you know, uh, speaking of diversity in terms of business confidence as well as in strategic choices, you talked about China's re entry post COVID now back into, uh, into the global economy, reopening, so to speak. Uh, trying to pull back on some of the regulations that they were cracking hard down on. What does that mean? I mean, in the short term, it could mean a fillip, a bump up as far as global growth is concerned. But how are global CEOs looking at China today? It's multifaceted, Shireen. I'd say if you look at a positioning in China for global CEOs the last few years, you know, what's true? They went down a different path on COVID. Um, there was also a stronger uh, uh, decoupling of the economy because of that. Um, there are very few things for U.S.-centric companies that, uh, that we can say the Democrats and Republicans can agree on. One is, you know, that there is a rival in the world. And so all of that, and that's as they sort of pulled back and said, well, we can't really access Chinese markets the way we used mm -hmm. to. And then China as a key part of the global supply chains what's happened the last few years, there were a lot of discontinuities on those supply chains. So there was a lot of um, resilience that companies tried to build to deal with the fact that, you know, China was sort of doing its own thing for a few years. And now, now that it's choosing in a very rapid way to re-enter the global economy, an economy the size of the U.S. is now going to come back into the global stage. We can come in and out. Um, that's making companies think about a lot of their choices on, um, on China, and it's, it's one of the big topics in 2023 strategy. What is your position in China? Do you, do you invest more away from it? Do you lean into it? How does it entering, re-entering the economy affect your, both your, your front end and your back end? Um, it's quite different, again, uh, industry by industry, country by country. Uh, India, uh, and I know that you know, there's a lot of interest at this point in time, especially when we talk about, uh, you know, uh, what's happening in China and then, of course, the, the manufacturing uh, destinations that the world is looking at at this point in time. Uh, one of the fastest growing large economies today. What's the mood like on India? 
You know, I remember when you and I spoke uh, back in May, and we were, uh, you know, we were bullish in India, and we frankly continue to be bullish. You know, in a in a world that uh, the clarity of the West versus Russia, and the West, let's say the West, developed Western economies versus China, has gotten clear. Whatever you call it, you know, rivalry. Um, India has stayed in a great position. You know, it, its demographics, uh, it's inherently attractive. It's got a great local market. You're one of the countries in the world that still have reasonable population growth, you know, an emerging middle class. And for everybody who's thinking about where should I invest, you know, it's now the largest country in the world, um, and is able to, uh, to operate in a world of Russia and China as an attractive place. Um, India is a bright spot for most companies uh, thinking about um, not just a place to invest mm -hmm. for the cu customer base, a place to invest for supply chain, for manufacturing, for technology. You know, uh, India is now the third largest source of uh, AI talent in the world. You know, the, the rapid um, evolution of um, knowledge workers in India from call centers a decade ago to now machine learning and our artificial intelligence. It's just lots of goodness about, uh, about India from a, global, from a global prioritization standpoint. Well, that's good to hear. Uh, you know, where are the sectors, or which are the sectors that you now see uh, disruptions, displacements? The tech sector, for instance, after the great run that we saw through COVID, uh, we're seeing a significant amount of pain, layoffs at this point in time. But, uh, you know, which are the areas that you believe we're in 2023 that are likely to see a significant amount of pain and which are the areas of opportunity, which are the sectors that are likely to see significant gains as well? You know, some, some of it is based on what I call long-term macro uh, trends. Uh, you know, we, we are still trying to invest to decarbonize the world and so there are transitions in that as you go from uh, fossil fuels to renewable energy. And then some of it is actually reactions to um, perhaps uh, over frothiness. So mm. if I look at the tech sector, um, what corrections needed to be made? Well, in the world where we all chose to figure out how to work remotely, yeah. you know, the tech, tech sector boomed. I'm, I'm from San Francisco. Every major global tech company in the Bay Area, you see the news every day, you know, layoffs. But put it in context, you know, a company like Salesforce doubled in size. Mm from 40,000 to 80,000 employees in the last few years. So they're making a correction and they, they made an announce. So that's what I call, you know, it's, it's adjustments mm. to almost uh, the, uh, the, uh, the over exuberance that uh, the tech will continue. But as we sit here with, uh, with 23, I think long term, we're still going to need to be digitally transforming mm -hmm. the world. We're still going to need to uh, build decarbonization and sustainability muscles. We're still going to need to figure out how to operate in a world of uh, this post-globalization period where Davos here is very different than when we're all operating with the same rules. And we were all global companies. So you can look industry, uh, industry by industry. Um, those will affect what will be you know, good 23s um, versus not. But it's, it's a little bit all over the map. It is a little bit all over the map. But what does it mean for a company like yours? Uh, I mean, how are you preparing for an era of uh, uh, poly crisis, for an era where volatility is, is the new normal, uh, and an era where you are seeing diverse uh, growth across, across the world? Uh, it's, it's, it's actually quite uh, interesting to both be a consultant um, of, uh, of business strategy and advice to CEOs and being one myself. And, uh, and so we, you know, we, we are a global professional service firm. We operate in every major geography. We operate in every major industry. So to some degree, um, I actually have one of the broadest views in the world. And so the way I would apply um, the strategic guidance, I would apply to clients. You know, strategy in a time of uncertainty, you know, build more resilience to your strategies, adjust faster. You know, which country do I invest in versus not? Which industry do I invest in versus not? Um, a little bit more predictability and, um, in scenario planning. We can't predict the future with point estimates, but we can scenario plan what happens if, right? And, and even the last few years, 
what happens in the next pandemic, what happens in the next war. You know, we, we don't want to be surprised anymore that um, the, the rapid reactions we all made on when Russia invaded Ukraine, you know, those are, those are much more predictable. And then we have to build more agility. So if we have resilience in our strategy, a little bit more predictability, and then adjust quicker, it's as much about um, making organizations move faster than point estimating, predicting a macro scenario that you build your strategy on. Yeah, because we don't have control on the macros in any case, so it, it, it makes more sense to focus on what is under our, our own control within organizations. It is, and, and frankly, uh, Shireen, this is probably how the world really should be. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, had a, uh, we had global management teams from roughly 2010 through 2020 that lived in a simple world, <laughs> right? Interest rates were low, steady global growth, we could, uh, we could almost, you know, we were all embracing globalization, mm -hmm. Davos, and, and some forgot, you know, I lived through 08, 09. I lived through 9, 11. Um, I lived through, you know, we had low interest rates for that decade, no inflation. You could say everything we're experiencing today, if you look at it in a 30, 40 year yeah. time perspective, yeah. this is just normal, yeah. <laughs> you know. You have to plan for um, capital structure choices, um, inflation choices, uh, globalization choices, while still digitizing and trying to make it sustainable. And you know, I think companies uh, like like ours and you know, organizations like CNBC have a role uh, to play in this in this world. And this is just the normal state. I wouldn't make that big a deal about it. Yeah, well, that, 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 is, that is another way of looking at it. But what is this going to mean now in terms of deals, in terms of M&A, in terms of fund flows, especially fund flows to emerging markets? Uh, what, what is the new reality? Uh, what's the new shape of, of flows likely to be? You know, there is, a, uh, there is a, a been a period of what I call a capital overabundance, um, both public and private, and that still continues. Um, private capital in particular, which uh, you know, we know a lot about, there is a lot of equity um, sitting out there. And so fund flows are a combination of um, absolute amount of flows, how much you're actually yeah. putting to work. And while we're in a period of uh, uncertain interest rates, you know, that flow has slowed down a little bit. Um, we will get there, right? Uh, at some point, back to lessons from 08, 09, um, there was about a four to six quarter slowdown until interest rates stabilize, and then you could actually predict to invest what combination of equity and debt um, and should you have. So I think once that happens, um, the absolute amount will actually um, you know, increase. By the way, it, it's not like it stopped. Yeah. FDI, for example, yeah. has been going. I mean, Korea has had one of the all-time high mm -hmm. uh, as an example of yet another economy that people are, are going in. Um, and then the question is, once you have it, where? And that's where some of the things we talked about earlier, you know, are you going to be long in India? Mm. You know, many, many companies and investors are. Are you going to be long in attractive markets? If I look at Asia, Southeast Asia, you know, is Japan ready? Is Korea ready? Do you go back into China now <laughs> as companies... Uh, uh, so I think this will uh, this will happen. We've had a little bit of a perhaps a, a pause to some degree, but by the second half of the year and through 24, uh, I think that uh, those flows will uh, will will open up again once we get to clarity on interest rates in particular. Well, let me end by asking you: if 2022 was all about supply chain <laughs> resiliency, what is 2023 likely to be? I think the new normal is you know. Uh, Predictable unpredictability. <laughs> How about that? And just, just the trust a consultant to come up with that. <laughs> By the way, you know, that, that's why you will need very good consulting advice during these uh, fierce and uncertainty. And we're definitely seeing it. Mm -hmm. well, Manny, it's always a pleasure. Thanks very much for joining us here on CNBC TV 18. We wish you the very best and have a great week here in Davos. Thank you, Shireen. Always great to be here. Well, we are going to take a break. There's a lot more coming up here. Our conversations continue. We're back in a moment from Davos 2023.
Fiestrips. Fiestrips.